What's up, YouTube? In this video, I'm reacting to Wozniak's uh, 20 rules for learning. And there's actually a number of these that I disagree with. And my disagreement comes from my personal experience, but more than that, my experience coaching and just participating in the uh, medical school study community. Uh, I created a course for U.S. med students taking the USMLE Step 1, which is the, it's kind of like almost the equivalent of the bar exam. It, you take it after your first two years of med school, and your score on that determines where you get your residency, which is like your apprenticeship before you uh, become a full doctor and, and are working independently as a full doctor. Uh, they recently changed it to pass-fail, so... People won't need the course as much and the scores, you know, don't matter anymore because it's pass fail. But um, that's where I learned what I what I believe here. And so, uh, you know, these rules, you know, rules are always a little bit to oversimplify and just to to give people basic structures. So um, I think if I hash these things out, uh with Peter, we'd probably, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce his name. Um, we'd probably agree on most of this stuff. Um, but I do want to sort of give my two cents and, you know, especially because if it just works for me, it's, it's kind of an anomaly, but things that I've seen consistently working amongst, uh, med students who, are going through pretty much med school is the most intense learning experience you can do in any profession. It's like the Navy SEALs hell week. Uh, it's just like sort of the most intense studying you can do over such a long period. So number one is learning stuff you don't understand. I don't majorly disagree with this one, but it actually is possible to learn stuff that you don't understand and have it be useful. And it happens in a variety of ways. Um, I've talked to people who do consulting work or do work with the government or military, and they have to read through these huge specification sheets or PDFs or stuff like that, where you just need to do, you need to learn stuff or, or get a primer. You need to, you know, you're not going to really understand it the first time or two through it, but you do it anyways. Um, and sometimes you'll memorize dates or names or people and you just know they're going to be useful in the future uh, or names of books or important papers. They're just, or even maps um, or certain diagrams or uh, frameworks or models, you know, they're going to be useful. And like another example, this in med school is like memorizing pharmacology stuff of all the different names of the different drugs. You, there's some stuff that you sort of almost can't understand. And there's some stuff that, like you need to learn for the test. You don't need to remember it. It's not really worth understanding it. It's like a bunch of chemistry, organic chemistry stuff you're never going to need to use later. Um, and this is where mnemonics can actually be used as sort of a hack. And there's special mnemonic, uh, I forget what they're called, pharma something, pharma cards. But they're, they're these drawings, these hand-drawn mnemonic devices for memorizing like really tough chemistry, organic stuff, and pharma, pharmacological stuff. And, and so with number two, that's the same thing. Like you usually should learn before you memorize, but it's not a hundred percent. You don't always need to do it. Um, there are exceptions. And so building from the basics, same kind of thing. Um, I think sometimes basics are a little too basic or they can be fitted into other things. There's a cost to every flashcard you create. So, and I know super memo goes beyond flashcards. Um, I haven't really gotten into that. Um, I, I think it's, I don't love being dependent on software like super memo to, to be doing the incremental reading and stuff. So, um, but I haven't evaluated enough to really have a strong opinion on it. Um, minimum information principle. I generally agree with this again, though, 
like the thing with a lot of these rules is that they don't really factor in how do you make trade-offs between making the ideal notes and flashcards versus saving time and you don't have infinite time so you always need to make trade-offs and uh and so sometimes I think, you know, I've done flashcards where there's paragraphs of stuff and you eventually will remember it. So it's not ideal. And and for really complex stuff, you do want to break it down more. But I generally make the trade-off where if it's like a lot of simple stuff or it, it neatly and nicely interconnects like it's sort of encyclopedic knowledge but it's it's like pretty easy to remember a lot of it uh that's when i'll do bigger flashcards where there's more stuff on the back and when it's like really tough like really precise really like tough to remember that's when i'll split it up into more flashcards and i think that's how you do a, the, the ideal trade-off number five uh close deletion so this has come up a lot in the medical the sort of med study uh, subreddit, med, med school Anki. A and the general consensus is that close is easy and it is fairly effective, but it's not as effective as question answer. So close is like fill in the blank. Like you just leave name blank. So this is Bill Clinton. So Clinton, you know, once you click on the button to show the back of the card, it would just show Clinton here. So the, the problem with closed deletion is you're not like if somebody asks you a generic or not generic general question about like, oh, who are the two people that were impeached or uh, who is the second person to be impeached? And you don't have that clue of bill and you don't have the exact sentence. You're not going to be able to recall that information as well. So I really try to avoid closed deletions. I pretty much never use them. Um, they are part of his incremental reading method. Um, and I part of what I don't like about the method, even though I haven't really given it a fair evaluation, is that you're still reliant on remembering the, like having all the clues there of the exact wording and all that context. And in the real world, you're not gonna have that context. So you're kind of on easy mode and then hoping in hard mode in the real world, it's still gonna work. Using imagery, I agree with that 100%. Using mnemonic t techniques, I agree with that. But again, you know, both of those are trade-offs. So a lot of times, it's just not worth the time to create those graphics. So that's the that's the real problem with this stuff. If if you have if you can buy flashcards or you can create them with a group or they're free, there's a community creating them, then you can do all this fancy stuff. When you're creating flashcards yourself or you're paying somebody else to create them for you, you, you have to make these trade-offs. Um, I agree that graphic deletion is, is as good as close and it's probably even better. Um, you can set it up in various ways with this thing. There's all this context and you can sort of cheat because you can see like, Wernick's area and that'll remind you that oh maybe it's another one of those areas because like there's the audio areas well, I think one of them's hearing one of them speaking so again like when you give yourself all these clues you're really shortchanging yourself and so I'll cover all these up I'll, I'll set it up so that everything is covered and then this will just be in red. All the other ones will be covered in a gray box. And that's how you know which one it's asking you about. So sets, like lists. Um, there's special techniques for how to do this. And it's, it's kind of boring, so I'm not going to get into it here. The, the key thing to do with lists is you know, put them in some kind of order if you can. So alphabetical order, put a number to it. Like what are the 13 or, or even if you don't put the number in the question, put it in the answer. Um, 
and you could even change the question to like what countries belong and how many are there. Uh, and then also you can do an acronym or you can group them into like certain uh, geographical areas. You could put a map. So like it, it just shows you like you actually can memorize this. It's It's not as easy and it's not as good, but it's not that bad either. So, and you can see how much more time it takes to do this. So, you know, I would number these, I would put these in a numbered list and I'd maybe separate them out by gr grouping them somehow. You know, I'd group Sweden and the Netherlands and Denmark together and maybe with that with the UK. So avoid enumerations, avoid sets. So... Yeah, this thing can work where you fill in different letters. It's not, uh, you know, breaking things up. But um, it's kind of a minor thing. You're, you're generally not going to be needing to memorize a huge number of lists. So interference is just when you don't have... Like what I'll do with the interference things, like two words that are very similar, like historic versus historical. I'll create a third card that is just about what's the difference between these two. And sometimes I'll suspend one of these and just learn the first one. Or first I'll learn the verse. Like I, I may even just not do an individual card on these two and just do one card that explains both of them. And like the general pattern here of like the minimum information principle is his overall point is you want to atomize the information into these really tiny sort of atomic chunks. And while it's a good idea, it's just very expensive in time. So uh, I, I think there's a good argument that there's a, a tr you have to always trade off there. Optimizing wording. That's a good one. I, I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> and sort of shortening stuff. So if you create, like if you're going through a textbook and you're just taking what's in the textbook, a lot of times the definitions won't be ideal. And so you want to rewrite those. You want to shorten them. You want to really zone in on the key distinctions. Referring to other memories. So yeah, this is good. Like use, use whatever you have. The, the, the one downside to this is that if you're sharing the cards with other people or somebody's creating the cards for you, uh, you know, you're not going to have the same memories. So just, that's a key thing to be aware of if you're doing that. And again, you know, so that's the downside of linking with your personal life and personalizing. Are these just for you or are they for you and other people? Or somebody creating these for you. And one thing you can do to get around that is you can add a third section to the back of the card, which is like personal examples. And so that way you can remove those uh, when you share the deck with somebody else. emotional states. So yeah, this is, you know, illustrating something with sh something bizarre or shocking or vivid. That's, that even kind of goes with mnemonics. This is a type of sort of emotional mnemonics, strong emotions, uh, celebrities. Context cues, simplifying wording. So yeah, you know, shortening words. This is kind of a repeat of one of the rules above. Then talks about redundancy. So yeah, I, I agree with this, especially when you have a huge amount of cards. You don't want to be re relying on like having a dependency to another card. Again, it's a trade-off. So it's, 
it's not like the end of the world if there's a little bit of, uh, if there isn't the ideal amount of redundancy. But you just need to be aware of like, when you're reviewing these cards and they're on different schedules, you may see one card one day and then not see the other related card until a week or a month later. So there needs to be enough detail there that you're you're going to be able to use each card basically independently of the other one. I like this one, providing sources. Um, if I take something from a Wikipedia article, I'll like to... You know, just put the link or put the book or the article that I got it from. I like to put that in a separate section at the bottom of the back of the card. Date stamping is good also. Um, I don't personally do this, but uh, I probably should. And prioritizing is is like just a general good principle. Um, and I talk about what I, the way I do this is I get initial sources, books, articles, courses, etc. I do a quick run through each of them and I give them a pre-grade, which is, I guess, if I read this thing entirely and in full, what would I grade it from zero to a hundred? I pre-grade all my resources and then I start with usually the top rated thing. So here's a summary of all the rules. And so overall, like the major thing, the, the major disagreement I have is, it, it's not that I believe any of these are like dead wrong. It's more that you can actually, like I've seen very successful people who have memorized just ridiculous, like literally 10, 20,000 cards and done super well on standardized tests, breaking a lot of these rules. So, but they were doing it in an intelligent way. So that's what I've tried to explain in this video is that there's an intelligent way to bend and break these rules. And it's, it's about getting beyond sort of these rules of thumb to getting to the point where you're making trade-offs. And you're thinking about, okay, is the extra time and effort spent or money spent doing this extra work to make the quality of the flashcard better, is that worth the time saved by having a better memorization? And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And for stuff that's kind of easy to memorize anyways, that's where it's especially easy for me to make the trade-off because I'm thinking like, you know, just do it a little bit more sloppy, more shooting from the hip, because it's going to be pretty easy to memorize anyways. And you have a sense of this when you're, uh, you know, if you know, you're going to be reading multiple books on the same subject, there's going to be a lot of crossover, a lot of repetition, natural repetition anyways, then you don't need to be worry as much about like having all this redundancy and all this, uh, like ideal situation set up and it can actually get kind of annoying like if you i've i've had somebody create like go through a textbook and pull out every single definition and like they're defining words that are just so simple and and the definitions aren't that good either they're just like textbook drivel so and it gets annoying to just have to click through all of these cards where it's like it's not a good definition and it's, you know, it's nicely formatted. It's like one of those textbooks that's like nicely formatted and on the surface, everything looks great. And then you look at the definitions of stuff and it's like, there's no, it's fluffy. It's like, everything is just sort of jello. Um, and so, you know, that's a, that's a source problem. And he talks about that, you know, provide high quality sources, prioritize those. So yeah, that's my overall, um, you know, opinion on these rules. And the reason I made this video is because I've seen so many people on Hacker News and on Reddit and just everywhere just sort of fall over themselves, like accepting these rules as gospel and not realizing that they're they are good rules of thumb, 
but there's like if you follow these to the letter you might take twice as much time to make your flashcards and go through them as I would doing my trade-offs and you wouldn't perform significantly better. You might perform 5% better and it took you double the time. So that's not a good trade-off. And being an accelerated learner, you're focused on time. You're trying to be efficient with time. And, uh, and so you do like eventually need to get to the point where you're thinking in terms of trade-offs and not just oversimplifying and following these rules in a, like a, an obsessive way. And, and I don't know that, uh, and I don't know that he, he advocates that you follow these in like a very orthodox way. Um, And, and he, like, if, if you look through the Super Memo website, there's a huge amount of really valuable articles and stuff. So he's a really, really smart guy. Um, I would say he's potentially even unparalleled in the accelerated learner learning and sort of memorization community for doing a huge amount of just, you know, he is a doctor. Uh, he's the guy who was featured in the, that old, uh, wired article that sort of set off the popularization of a lot of this stuff. So he's a really legit guy and legit academic and has really great content on his site. And I think he has one or two other sites. So, you know, I, I think, I think what would be interesting is, is if he talked about like, how he like does he ever make trade-offs does he make exceptions and i haven't seen him ever write about that um so i would like to see that and if if any of you watching this have seen stuff like that please put that in the comments because i like to see that um so yeah uh that's pretty much it let me know what you think down in the comments. Make sure to like and subscribe if you want to get more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video.